Uh, the first question that comes to mind is why, as GP, should you care about this patient blood management chatter that's been going on not only in WA but nationally and internationally? It has a lot to do with what you were trained um, regarding anemia and iron deficiency in school and for today's purposes we'd like you to try to forget all of that that you learned because it was based on on very old information in the last 20 years we've gotten a whole new set of evidence and a whole new set of uh, standards for transfusing as well as iron deficiency and we're going to walk through that so that you have a foundation for the rest of the day to build on uh, if you understand where this is all coming from. So first of all, what is it? This is the nicest explanation I've been able to find and um, I actually changed a little bit of it because it really does clearly define what we're talking about. Although many institutions have implemented blood utilization review programs that minimize transfusion and promote appropriate transfusion, a PBM program stresses the implementation of an evidence-based multidisciplinary approach to optimizing the care of patients who might need transfusion at present or in the future. PBM is an approach that crosses all hospital boundaries. PBM includes interventions taken early in the preparation of medical and surgical patients for treatment, as well as techniques and strategies in the preoperative, operative, and postoperative periods. So of course, this involves you. It involves the patients that will someday in the future require surgery. It involves the chronically ill on a daily basis, their activities of daily living, and how you receive them back from the hospitals after they've had intervention or an acute illness um, incident. So therefore, we wanted to make sure, here we've been working for six years now, trying to get this across the state and across the country, and we've been wanting to uh, approach the GPs and get them more engaged in all of this information, and now's our opportunity. You're now the third series of uh, Medicare Local that we have introduced this information to, and that's why we're doing the film today, so that we can disseminate this to everyone who's not geographically able to come to one of these. So what does it engage? You'll hear many times from different specialists and clinicians that it, all it engages in is reducing the amount of transfusion delivered. That's not true. We're talking about the medical patient, we're talking about the preoperative patient, we're talking about the postoperative. So therefore, it covers all of these different things with the goal of improving patient outcomes. These are the three pillars that you'll hear referred to off and on as you hear about PBM across the country and in the international evidence. Optimizing patient blood count, minimizing blood loss, and optimizing physiological function. We don't emphasize this quite as much as we used to because it forgets about that medical patient on the outpatient side. And so we wanted to make sure that you understood that these are the different phrases that you'll hear from time to time. So back in 2010, the WHO actually said that this needs to be international, that this needs to be a standard of care everywhere for all of these different reasons that are mentioned on this slide. Growing blood product, supply shortages, high transfusion costs that go up annually, even though in the public health sector we're not presently pain in the hospital for the blood, it will be soon. There's three states that are already having the hospitals pay for their own blood product and the public sector and WA, it will come to fruition in the near future because the cost of blood in the last 20 years is astronomically changed in comparison to where it was when we first thought it was free. Unpredictable infectious risks, as you know, every year we hear of about a new bacteria or a new virus or a new prion that is cited in blood products that we cannot screen for 100% and therefore it increases the risk. Emerging evidence of adverse transfusion outcomes, we're going to talk about some of those today. Relatively few indications for which transfusion has been shown to be benef beneficial, we'll talk about the literature on that and challenges are likely to raise concerns in an increasingly informed patient population. The public is not as uh, naive when it comes to these subjects as they have been 20, 40, 50 years ago. So why is there so much confusion? Well, part of the reason is it takes many years after evidence has been strongly published for clinical practice to change. You trust while you're in school that your professors are teaching you state-of-the-art information when in actuality maybe it has been a very slow process for them to uh, stay up to date on the literature as well. 
And since we're only talking about the last 20 years that this evidence has really come to fruition, therefore, um, I don't know how long ago each one of you were in school, but some of you, I'm guessing it's been at least 20 years since you left, and therefore uh, you're still basing your decisions based on what you were taught in school. So where did this all start? This started with a uh, anesthetist, anesthetist in the United States who was the father of general anesthesia. He was really highly thought of as the, the godfather of anesthesia. His name was Lundy, and he made a quotation in a very popular journal that was used for years and years, especially in the military, regarding transfusion and the use of blood products, that perhaps a hemoglobin of 80 to 100 would be the uh, preferred number that you would want to start giving blood anywhere in that range in order to have a patient more uh, prepared for surgery. It was not based on science. It was not based on studies. It was no double blind, uh, no placebos, no um, altercation of restrictive and conservative. It was based on guesstimation and the fact that the um, uh, military historically had been in this horrible position of massive blood loss without any way to uh, make, help these people survive. So therefore, that's what it was based on, was the necessity at the time. So what we're asking you to do is be part of, dis of dispelling the myths of transfusion, dispelling the myths of iron deficiency, and being part of the instrumental change for the community that you serve. There at the bottom, I've got uh, Blood Safe e Learning cited, and you're going to see a little short clip on that this afternoon at lunchtime so that you can start utilizing this e learning website, which is free presently. It's very, very well done by experts in the field uh, for anyone who wants to participate in it. Eventually, it's getting so popular, over 10,000 modules are completed every month, and it's internationally based, although it was created here in Australia. Can you be instrumental in changing the standard of care practice? We also have our website on the DOH, which you can even just search in Google, Western Australia Patient Blood Management, and our website pops up, and we've got all kinds of educational pieces in there as well. So maybe these sound familiar to you. Blood is safer than it's ever been and is still the standard of care for the treatment of anemia. If I need to transfuse, I might as well give two units instead of one. Other than the correct group and screen, all red blood cells are alike. We will transfuse because we need to optimize his O2 carrying capacity, and his hemoglobin is 100 or 100, therefore he needs to be transfused or he may have multi-organ damage. After all, we transfuse by using hemoglobin as a trigger. Guess what? None of that is evidence-based. This is just but is handed down from one generation uh, to another, and it was thought to be the best that we could provide at the time that we heard it. Dr. Lena uh, Napolitano in Michigan is a trauma specialist who also was a critical care specialist, obviously, and she started pouring in in 2009, going through the literature, trying to see just how many of the published papers were citing what the VO2 did at the same time as the DO2 after transfusion. And in those 20 stu studies, there was a uh, end value of 499. Transfusion was observed only in 15 of the DO2 and three of the VO2. Therefore, we're not supplying the oxygen in that statement that we heard earlier with they need the oxygen carrying capacity. It's landing on the arterial side. It's not making it to the venous side. So when we're measuring our uh, arterial blood gases after we transfuse, yes, they've gone up but on the venous side, it is not. So therefore, we're not doing exactly what we thought we were doing when we were trained the way we were. What about one unit versus two? Well, this, and I'd like you to um, keep an eye on the dates on these different publications. This is not new information, okay? But this shows you how slow it takes for, to change practice. This is the risk factors that come with open heart surgery, the four main ones, severe infection, mediastinitis, pneumonia, and sepsis. With each unit of RBCs, you compound the risk factor. You do not return to baseline with each one unit that's transfused. During that stay, each one of these risk factors compound on top of the other. So you can see what happens with severe infection after just four units of blood in those cardiac patients. So what about some of the other literature? Here's one unit versus two in the non-cardiac 
um, population. This was a composite of 125,000 patients. It was designed multivariant logistic regression was used to assess influence of transfusion on outcomes while adjusting for transfusion propensity, procedure type, wound class. So in other words, all those arguments, sicker patients get transfused. So they re extracted out those different items and the results were after adjustment for transfusion propensity procedure group, wound class, operative durations, and all other important risk value, one unit significantly increased the risk of 30-day mortality, composite morbidity, pneumonia, sepsis, shock, transfusion of two units additionally increased risk for these outcomes plus surgical site infection. So therefore, just one to two units makes a big difference. Why? Well, we don't know for sure. In fact, there's six major uh, studies going on internationally presently to find out the age of blood, where the risk factors lie. We're at 42 days with RBCs right now. And as you can see on these morphologies, they were, these were published in 1999, showing you the aging of the cell and what happens. No one gets a one-day-old unit of blood. It just doesn't happen. It takes too many days to process, get it out of the blood bank. Average maybe 21 days, and you can see the morphology of the RBC is already changing, and day 35 at its capacity, it's right before it's going to be expiring. There's also a new school of thought that says these little pointy things, these ridges that you see on this picture, actually are breaking off in microorganism type part partitions and debris basically floating around, which adds to the inflammatory response. So the structural and functional, uh, functional impairment of stored RBCs are impaired. Number one, the oxygen carrying releasing capability. The older the cell, the less likely it will allow the O2 to separate. The 2,3 DPG is very low at the older the cell gets process starts within the first week of age of those RBCs. And when stored erythrocytes become less deformable, blood viscosity is modified. They may cause the microcirculatory occlusion or those breaking off of those fragments. And then you have the loss of vascular control and increase in uh, vascular permeability, systemic inflammation, sepsis, nitrous oxide, toxic oxygen, so on and so forth. These are the inflammatory cytokines you don't like to see in your patient. And unfortunately, there's been some studies that have also shown that the preatologous donation or the patient's own blood that has been stored will also instigate these different inflammatory re reactions as they're transfused. So therefore, the storage issue comes into play. Is it the aging of the cell, or is it truly just that it's someone else's blood? So any way you look at it, a surgical patient or an acutely ill patient, you do not like delivering these different inflammatory properties. So the degree of impact on outcomes from blood transfusion is directly related to how many units they get and the mean age of what they've received. Prolonged use of post-operative ventilator support is one of the outcomes that is measurable. Longer health stays. Increased post-operative morbidity increased by a factor of 1.4 and some studies up to 1.8 and complications including wound infection and pneumonia, early cancer recurrence, and diminished organ function. Not things that you really want for your patient. So the big first big turning of the page, you know those pivotal things that have happened in medicine in, um, over the last century, this is one of them. The TRIC study in 1999 in the New England Journal was the first time the randomized study was done showing a higher transfusion rate versus a lower transfusion rate as the hemoglobin trigger for when to transfuse. And it was a difference of uh, under 10, 100, 100 to 120 versus 70 to 90. The outcome, no difference in the 30-day mortality. Now, the true test of any good study is can it be repeated? It was repeated in trauma, repeated in moderate to severe head injuries, repeated in cardiovascular disease, in mechanical ventilation patients. Then Jeff Carson in New Jersey of the United States and across the country had this uh, very well done study because doctors were saying after the 99 paper came out, well that doesn't apply to the surgical patient, especially the elderly. They need a higher hemoglobin level in order to recover and in order to go home. Well this was able to disprove that myth as well. 
2,000 patients randomly assigned, conserved and restrictive arm again, and the outcome, the primary outcome was death or an inability to walk across a room without human assistance in 60 days. A liberal transfusion strategy as compared with a restrictive did not reduce the rates of death or inability to walk independently on 60-day follow-up. So again, disproving that old myth of that 100 hemoglobin. Well, as of two days ago, which was rather exciting, I just slid these two slides in because of this paper that just popped up, we now have the same type of study published in sepsis. Sepsis is one of the one areas that many doctors felt you have to keep that O2 capacity up, you have to keep them transfused, when in actuality the outcome was almost identical for the higher transfused level versus the lower transfused level. So this is really exciting. It just came out two days ago. So it, this was in um, a summary that Jeff Carson and Polly Bear, who wrote those first couple of very important papers, did in the Cochrane Review in 2012 that basically we need to actually look at a 70 hemoglobin, not a 100 hemoglobin, and that so far all the evidence says when it hits 70 or below, then you need to seriously think about transfusing depending upon the patient and what's going on with them. So what does this have to do with iron? Well, when you think about the amount of evidence that has been published in transfusion over the last 20 years, the issue at hand here is that we really weren't looking at iron. We had an iron product for many, many years that had a high anaphylaxis rate of about 2 to 5 percent. It's been off the market now for almost 30 years, and yet we still think about it. Our instructors all told us it kills patients. It's a horrible drug. You don't want to ever use it. When in actuality, it's been gone for a long time. We have much safer products, and now we have done evidence-based studies on iron deficiency. In fact, in the last five years, we've learned more than we had in the 20 years before, specifically because a group of different specialists around the world, nephrologists and cardiologists, were looking very aggressively at studies over iron deficiency and anemia in the chronic cardiac failure patient. And it's really profound information that has come out. And that will be one of your biggest candidates, obviously, that you see on a rotating basis through your office. So we're going to cover that later today as well. I'll just touch on some of it now. So here's some of these myths that maybe you recall. His hemoglobin is low, therefore his treatment should be transfused first to worry about his iron stores later. He will get all the iron he needs when he gets transfused. His ferritin is normal, therefore he doesn't have iron defi deficiency. His hemoglobin is normal, so I don't need to check his iron level. No one checks iron panels before surgery. As long as we have a full blood count, that's all you need. Iron infusions kill people. I won't give him one. He can take oral iron. And he has some chronic anemia with a slightly low hemoglobin pre-op. If he runs into preoperative or perioperative blood loss, I'll top him off. All not evidence-based issues. So what it adds to your confusion as you're trying to decide for uh, your patient whether they're iron deficient or not, unfortunately, the lab values that we're used to reading high, low, and normal are quantity measurements. Iron deficiency is not a quantity measurement. It is a relative measurement. And so we're going to talk about some of those oddities in the iron panels that exist today and how you should readjust your thinking when you're assessing whether your patient is iron deficient or not. The first one that comes to mind is ferritin has always been considered the golden rule, so to speak, as to the true measurement of iron deficiency. It's actually the most inaccurate that you can use as your guidance for um, iron deficiency, and we're going to talk about why that is a little later, too. Michael Leahy's going to be covering the physiology of iron in itself, but the biggest issue here is that you cannot rely on it as the only measurement, therefore you do need to do a full panel. Ferritin is adjusted up according to these different products. These different products, in other words, you could have a normal ferritin, think your patient's just fine, but if they're taking any of these apply to your patient, you've actually got an inflated ferritin, which is not truly accurate. They never get affected downward with ferritin from these products. They only go upward. So let's say you have a patient with a very low iron level in their system, but their ferritin will measure normal to high, when in actuality they are not iron replete. So we'll talk about that and how you're going to rule that out. 
one of the ways that you can figure it out is number one, by your history, as you always do, and you know whether or not they've got chronic inflammatory course going on. But you can also look at your CRPs. CRPs aren't 100% reliable, but they're a good guidance. The soluble transferrin receptor is another issue. It's useful in the inpatient side, but no one's been able to prove that it really is helpful on the outpatient side. In your handouts, you have this table, and you're welcome to keep that and utilize it in the future, so I don't need to go through that for you. But here's what you're going to see in iron deficiency, and this is why it's so confusing for the clinician in order to try to make this decision. You can see anything from a low to a normal um, hemoglobin. You can see a low to a normal MCV. You can see a low MCH. RDW will be slightly elevated or normal. Serum iron can be normal to low and so on and so forth. So that's why it's so confusing and that's why you need to do a full panel in order to rule out iron deficiency because all of them are so fluctuating that you have to get the full picture in order to make a decision. So Michael will talk about the physiology of the functions of iron. We know now it's not just for making RBCs. It has, like I said, from those different studies that have transpired in the last five years, we have a huge array of information showing the quality of life, activities of daily living, uh, ejection fraction for the heart is even affected by iron deficiency, and it does not have to come with anemia. So therefore, it is something that's important enough to measure prior to the anemic incident. Another thing that a lot of people think, and like I said on those myths, is that um, you can just transfuse somebody and you fix the iron deficiency. No, what you did is you raised the hemoglobin. You did not fix the iron deficiency. That unit of blood may have at the grand total of 100 to 200 milligrams of elemental iron in that one unit of blood when in actuality the average adult who is iron deficient needs a minimum of 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams of iron. So therefore, what have you done? You've raised the hemoglobin for a very short period of time. You think they're fixed, they feel a little bit better, but within a few weeks or days, their numbers actually start to drop off again because you did not fix the iron deficiency. So another part that is confusing for the clinician is all these different phrases that are kicking around regarding iron deficiency. You can read, depending upon the age of the literature you read, you get all these different names. So which one do I pay attention to? Which one means anything to me? And for today's purposes and in the last few years, absolute and functional are the two diagnoses that are, exist. What you're going to see in the office when you see a ferritin that is down in that low, that single digit or maybe that double digit range is your absolute iron deficiency and it may say normal on your screen when in actuality this patient is almost empty of all iron stores and the hemoglobin is soon to be plummeting right behind it. Your functional iron is the patient who doesn't have the hemoglobin drop out yet, but um, they are functionally iron deficient relative to what is ahead of them. In other words, for the preoperative patient, which we'll talk about this afternoon, that patient needs a certain bulk of iron on board for certain surgical conditions because of the upcoming blood loss that is going to occur. Therefore, they need to have enough sufficient iron on board in order to erythropoiesis successfully. It actually slows the erythropoietic process if you don't have that backup ready and available immediately. Another thing that people forget is that when they're sending their patients off for elective surgery that is going to have a blood loss, why is it the blood bank, who always has a shortage, refuses their patients to donate if their hemoglobin is below 125, and yet we're sending patients off for elective surgery with those numbers. So that kind of puts things a little bit in perspective as you're evaluating your patients. So what about anemia in the pre-op setting? This is a risk associated with preoperative anemia. This was in anesthesiology in 2009, 7,700 patients retrospective. Anemia is a common condition in surgical patients and is independently associated with increased mortality. Although anemia increases mortality independent of transfusion, it is associated with increased requirement for transfusion, which is also associated with increased mortality. So anyway, you look at it, having their iron stores replete and their hemoglobin within a normal range, you're sending your patient to surgery the best you can. 
And again, this one in non-cardiac patient, uh, patients. This is a prospect of 227,000 patients. And out of those patients, 30 to 44% had preoperative an anemia. We're gonna talk about uh, the percentage that we see here locally in the cardiac and orthopedic patient population soon, so you can kind of get your head wrapped around from the GP's perspective how much of your patient population this is engaging. So out of these different publications, a group of different specialists from around the world, led by Tim Goodnow from uh, University of Southern California, got together to propose different expectations that would need to be put in place for a preoperative orthopedic patient and they're listed on your handout that you are receiving on these PowerPoints. I won't go through each one of them. This is the list that we recommend to all our anesthesia departments in the tertiary centers in town. As to those patients that would require a full workup, including iron stores, these are all predictable, measurable blood loss patient procedures. Therefore, you have to look at the iron stores in order to fully prepare your patient appropriately. Percutaneous valve intervention, we have just added recently to this list due to the fact that the numbers are climbing and the transfusion rate is climbing and therefore we sat and analyzed that. It isn't as though there's a large blood loss involved with percutaneous intervention, but at the same token, if the patient's arriving in an anemic condition, an iron deficient condition, their quality of recovery is such that the cardiologist feels, well, I better give him a unit of blood in order to get his hemoglobin up a little bit higher. Therefore, we're seeing a higher transfusion rate occur due to the pre-existing condition that the patient comes in as. So anyone that you think is at high risk for cardiac disease or intervention falls into this same category. So I took, uh, Fremantle Hospital has been recording and absorbing their patient population for the last three years in the orthopedic and cardiac surgery side. So I went through their three years worth of patients recorded and it came out the same as it came out when I was in US systems uh, at hospitals in the United States. It's almost identical. This is an international issue. So 25% of these patients at Fremantle were iron deficient and anemic before going to surgery and had to be optimized. 25% of them were iron deficient only and did or did not require optimization depending upon the specific category of procedure that was being done. So any way you look at it, 50% of these patients think how long they have been ill or in an inflamed state prior to surgery intervention. They all fall into that same category. Half of them are iron deficient and anemic, half of them are iron deficient. So this is what's happened in our region and across the country. Back in 2010, we were told that, that the Australian Commission of Safety and Quality was going to come around and start putting different standards that are required for each hospital. So on the public health side, we've gone across state by state, looked at the issuance data for red blood cells. So you can see 2010, which is the dark blue. Um, started to show a little bit of a change across the states. Then on 2011, they said as of the first of the year in 2012, we're going to make it an expectation that you will be showing that you're trying to demonstrate some kind of reduced transfusion and more appropriate anemia treatment. And now down at the very bottom at the last one, you can see it now. Fortunately, WA has been very aggressive in this since 2008, and therefore we are still the lowest transfuser in the country. Uh, per po patient population, which is we're very proud of. This is WA specifically. Since we've started these programs across the region and since we've started this education series, you can see how much less we're using of blood across the board. The reason why the cryoprecipitate is going up is because we're using these wonderful little devices that analyze platelets so that we can more specifically treat coagulopathy <coughs> interoperatively and postoperatively with this device and therefore cryo seems to fit the bill a little bit better than FFP and therefore that's why the numbers are dropping and going up on the other direction. This is only from 2010 to 2013. This is total hip replacements in the three tertiary centers, transfusion rate versus knees on the bottom. 
and you can see how excellent the different programs are doing. In fact, two of our hospitals, Fremantle specifically, has had a 0% transfusion rate in their knees for the last two years, and now uh, Charlie's is doing the same. So they have really made great intervention, and this is all with preoperative assessment and optimization, which we hope you soon will be engaging in yourselves. Here's what's going on. The cardiac population, you can see at the bottom the green line, which is the percutaneous cases, they're going up uh, as more cardiologists are doing them, and therefore you're seeing that starting to drift upward. But all across the board, the three centers are doing a wonderful job in cardiac surgery, and the transfusion rate is reducing drastically. And this is housewide what's happening uh, by specialty across the board. Vascular surgery, can't do a lot about it, unfortunately. They come in in a crisis and it's a big, fast bleed. And so we're, we have made some headway, but at the same token, it's still gonna be the biggest blood loss. But you can see across the board, every single specialty, this culture <coughs> disseminates throughout the institution as it gets aggressive in one service line or another. And I wanted to show you this as far as the length of stay when we were talking earlier about the longer length of stay for transfuse. This is in total hips and knees. The red, the red barrel is the transfused patient versus the blue barrel, which is the non-transfused patient. You can see how much longer the patients are in the hospital once they're transfused and increase that inflammatory properties that we talked about, increases the risk of wound infections by as much as 25%. So we're talking about a huge indicator for, not only for the economy, but also obviously for our patients first and foremost. And again, in open heart surgery, the same scenario applies. Thank you.